Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd Continue on, this is the 10th lesson in our study of Usul al-Sunnah by Imam Ahmed And we're speaking about the importance of avoiding sectarianism and avoiding innovation and avoiding the people of innovation and the importance of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een and the Sunnah of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam said in an authentic hadith Ruahu Ashaba Sunan, Ashaba Sitta, or Ashaba Sunan, where the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam said, If Tarakatil Yahud ala Ithda was a bain firqa, with Tarakatin Nasara ala Ithnatain was a bain firqa. وَسَتَفْتَرِكُ هَذِهِ أُمَّةِ عَلَى ثَلَاثَ وَسَبَعِينَ فِرْقَةً كُلُّهَا فِي النَّارِ إِلَى وَاحِدَةً قُلْنَا مَنْ هِيَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ قَالَ مَنْ كَانَ عَلَى مِثْلِ وَمَا كَانَ عَلَيْهِ وَأَصْحَابِ الْيَوْمِ That the Prophet ﷺ said, which affirmed for us all of those foundations of the sunnah that Imam Ahmed had so meticulously mentioned for us, the Prophet Wasallam said, if tarakatil yahud ala ita wa sab'in farqa, that the Jews had broken to 71 sects, and the Christians in the 72 sects, and my ummah in the 73 sects, all of them in the fire except one. And then they said, who are they, Ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, those who are upon my sunnah and the, and the way of my companions. And then in another hadith, which we're all familiar with, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, where the Prophet ﷺ said, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالسَّمْعِ وَطَاعَةً وَإِنْ عَبْدٍ هَبَشِيًا فَإِنَّكُمْ مَنْ يَعِيشْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِيشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَاءَ اِخْتِلَافٍ فَإِنْ فَإِنْ فَإِنَّكُمْ مَنْ يَعِيشْ مِنْكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ فَسَيَرَاءَ اِخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي وَسُنَّتَ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَحْدِينَ أَذُوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاذِجِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْتَثَرَ الْأُمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٌ The Prophet ﷺ said, or the general meaning in case there were some mistakes in the, in the exact narration which I just made, mistakes in my uh, reciting the narration. The Prophet ﷺ said what means, fear Allah and be obedient Listen and hear and obey the Sultan, even if he was an Ethiopian slave. For verily, those who live after me will see many differences. So it is upon you, my Sunnah, and the Sunnah of the Khulafa Rashidin, meaning the Abu Bakr, wa Umar, wa Uthman, wa Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een. So it's upon you, my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa Rashidin, al Mahdiin, adhere to it or bite onto it, cling to it with your molar teeth. And beware of newly invented matters. For every newly invented matter leads is going astray. Verily, every innovation is misguidance and every misguidance leads to the fire. 
There are immense fawaid there, but I, the purpose of mentioning those two hadith is because those two hadith articulate almost this whole, what we've uh, talked about in the, in the past 10 lessons. They form the main foundations of the sunnah that Imam Ahmed was talking about. Clinging on to the sahaba, meaning how do we adhere to the sahaba? We adhere to their methodology, their minhaj, and understanding the religion and propagating the minhaj. How do we cling to what the Sahaba are upon? We cling to the Aqidah, the creed that they were united upon. How do we cling to what the Sahaba were upon? We adhere to the fiqh. And that was the Asul Sunnah. That's the first Asul Sunnah Indana that Imam Ahmed mentioned in the beginning of the treaties. And also, the second point regarding that hadith and its relevance to what we're experiencing now. It's listening and obeying the leader. And by Allah, it is amazing. I'm amazed at how we see it in our lifetime, not only just throughout history, but in our lifetime, look at what we've witnessed in the past 10 years. How many even wicked uh, leaders that were removed, leaders that were, some of them were non-Muslim, some of them perhaps were still in the fold of Islam, and Allah knows best their, their situation. But the situation in Iraq, the situation in Libya, what's going on in Syria, what's going on in Egypt. It's amazing. All of those places experience still to this day immense pain. And what happened in Afghanistan as well. Immense pain and, and torment for the Muslims, for the believers and the non-believers. The facade of all of those situations is immense. It's immense, and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what will come out of that chaos, if any good will come out. But we know the people in Iraq still suffer to this day. They're suffering immensely. And we know that the people of Egypt are suffering this very day. 200 people killed, or 300 or more killed, women shot in the head. What are you saying? What kind of democracy is this? And look at this. Look at how Ikhwan and Muslimin... As an Islamic group, they try to play by the system, the world system, the world, many of the world countries, they worship by democracy. And I have to say, they worship democracy. It is not about that that is the political ideology they love. They worship democracy. They love democracy. To the, they will kill you for it. They will impose it upon your land. They will remove your leader. They will impose it on you through sanctions, economic, uh, you know, material sanctions, any which way. They worship democracy. And that's what they that's what they say on their tongues, but they don't necessarily practice that in their countries. The point being is this, Akhwan al-Muslimin, they went by the system. They played the game and they voted and they this, and the man won a legitimate in accordance with their system. He won. But now no one says anything. America won't even admit. And I don't mean this to be a political darse, but this is imperative for us to look at this and analyze and learn from these lessons that... They claim democracy, but yet they don't want to call it a rebellion so they don't have to uh, give, uh, cut off the aid from Egypt. They support people who are democratic tyrants, democratic in their name because they removed this man forcibly, who was the leader. They moved him through rebellion, removed him. And now they're trying to establish a secular system by the same force, worse than this man and their group, even a Khwala al-Muslimin, this time, they went through the system. And they didn't, and it wasn't violent. But the world only respects the violence. And that's a sad and terrible, terrible, uh, shows we're in a ter terrible state of affairs. That they, and, and look at the facade that it's causing to women and children. And Egypt, their economy has been devastated and it will be continue to be devastated. There's no way they're just going to just jump out of this crisis. And all of this is because of removing the leader. But Ahlul Sunnah, the Salaf and the Salafis are away from this. We take those principles from the earliest scholars and they told us and they wrote about it. And we take it first and foremost from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, obey Allah and obey the messenger and obey the leader. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, listen and obey to the, uh, the Muslim authority.
even But if he calls you to masiyah, to, to sinfulness, to disobedience to Allah, then there's no hearing and obeying in that thing which he called you to. Not in totality because he made a mistake or he even he did something wicked. That doesn't mean you rebel. So the point here from the usul of sunnah, and we'll get into this more in detail, is that we don't rebel. And all of that's contained in that hadith. Listen and obey even if your leader was an Ethiopian slave. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. And many ahadith, just go to Sahih Muslim, go to the chapter of Imara, and you'll see tons of hadith. Even if the leader beats your back and takes your wealth, you should still hear and obey him, not rebel against him. If he still establishes the prayer, you shouldn't rebel. And if you don't have the ability, meaning if he has left the fold of Islam entirely, and you do not have the ability to change that munkar, then do not. And the ability is, is that your society is not going to be bleeding, blood's not going to be in the street. Muslim blood, non-Muslim blood, everyone's blood in the street. Those are one of the conditions. Al-maslah wa mafsada. That there is more benefit then there is harm but we see only harm from what happened in Iraq and the people of Iraq and may Allah rectify their affairs we only see harm at what happened to our brothers and, Af- and sisters in Afghanistan and we only see harm in what happened even in Yemen the harm to their their economy and the bloodshed and we only see harm in 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 Syria what's going on they still haven't removed this evil wicked shaitan he's a shaitan but still at least you had stability at least you had stability. Now you've invited uh, extremism to come to the fore. And you've allowed the bloodshed of the Syrian people and the Muslims everywhere. Bleeding. Destruction and devastation. It's better to have stability and be patient and worship Allah until Allah blesses you with an opening to and rectifies your affair. But bloodshed and wanton violence rarely goes anywhere. And rebelling against the leader is against the qawaid and usul of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad.